All right, so good morning, guys. It is Friday, May 22nd. This is biology period four. And we're looking at our uh, Schoology page. Um, for those of you just joining us, uh, like I had said, there is a scheduled uh, quiz that I put for today. And after I finish talking about what I need to talk about with you guys today, you'll be, go ahead, you'll, you'll, you'll be good to take that quiz. However, it is a three-day weekend. Uh, Monday is Memorial Day, and the principal has told us it's a holiday, so there's no school, there's no, there's no, not even online school because it is a holiday, it's a national holiday, and I assume you guys have military family, I do, so, so let's be respectful, let's honor our veterans and celebrate them in whatever way we can, right, if you want to do Zoom with your family and celebrate them and call them, do it, but it is, uh, it is a national holiday, so Monday there will be no school. Um, my bad, I had originally put the natural selection simulation for that date. So obviously I'm gonna change that. So that's good for you. That gives you some extra time to work on it. So I will change that date. Um, although we're not meeting, I'm still not gonna ask you to do work on a holiday. Okay, so I will, I will push that, that date for the simulation back. Any questions about that? All right, cool. So then, so then after that simulation, guys, you'll be complete with the evolution module. So um, let's go ahead and look at what we have left in the evolution module then. All right, so for the evolution module, remember um, we left off um, on Wednesday, we were talking about chapter 11. So if you go to your red folder, your evolution folder, remember this module is made up of a couple of different units. I mean, a couple different chapters. So we finished chapter 10 on Monday, and then Wednesday we started chapter 11 called Ev Evolution of Populations. So that's where we'll continue today. Um, for those of you that still haven't submitted everything, I always get emails about people asking me if they can submit something, a little later than usual and you know me I'm, I'm okay with it at this point guys i'm just glad that you know the nine of you are still here still showing up to class and still doing the work so at this point yes please do it if you still haven't done um like your discussion board or something like that just just go ahead and get on it uh this was due on monday uh it's only a few days late i'm not i'm not tripping guys it's not that big of a deal just do it i'd rather give you some points than no points just please do it um, so let's go ahead and then pick up where we left off, which is chapter 11. Any questions for me so far based on what I've said? All right, so let's go ahead and look at chapter 11. Can you guys see my PowerPoint here? Yes. Okay, cool. So what we were talking about on Wednesday, for those of you who, who weren't here, is we started talking about um, populations. Um, can you tell us, please, in your own words, how about uh, how about Cynthia? What is a population in your own words? Like a something. Like a group of like a group of what? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Okay, no worries, no worries. Uh, Melissa, in your own words, can you tell us what a population is? Like, the, Need some help? Yes. Okay. Uh, Jessica, do you remember what a population is? Um, a population is like, um, like the number of species in like one area. Exactly. Exactly. So it's funny that now um, my other cat is here. <laughs> so. Um, Something you said is really important, Jessica. You said the same species in the same area. So I have one cat here. This is this is Chubbs, by the way. And then you have myself, and then you have my other cat, Chappie. So Jessica, 
Um, in this room that I'm in right now, which is my office, um, how many populations would you say there are? Um, two. Two, right? What are those populations? Um, a human and cat. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It would be humans and cats. And the reason I'm, I'm glad that you said that and, and I want to introduce um, this concept of populations now is because when we get into ecology next week, um, the word species is incredibly important to understanding um, populations and populations are important to understanding communities and communities are important to understanding uh, habitats and then we're going to get to how everything's interconnected. So a species is, is just one thing that can interbreed with itself. So for example, this cat and this cat are the same species, right? Not only are they both, um, you know, cats, but, but genetically, their DNA is almost identical, right? Whereas me, I am not a cat, obviously, right? No matter how much I wish I was, I'm not a cat because our DNA is different. So like Jessica said, we're different species and because there's more than one cat, there's two, they make up a population. So populations are just groups of the same species in an area. Now, what I wanna talk about then is how um, natural selection uh, works with populations. So last week, I mean, not last week, sorry, last meeting, last Wednesday, we talked about populations, but we also talked about uh, the gene pool. Can anyone tell us what is a gene pool about uh, Vanessa? Do you remember what a gene pool is? Um, I think it's, okay, hold on. I think it's a collection of genes that gives the, the species their, like, individual variations exactly. within the, like, population. Exactly. So, looking at my cats, because they've decided to join me today, what would you say is the gene pool for my cats? So, let me show you, let me show you these little guys here. They're, oh my gosh, now he's going all over the place. So, we have that guy. Okay. So, what would you say is the gene pool for these guys, Vanessa? The, the genes for um, black fur, well, black and white fur, and I can't see the color eyes, and the genes for um, orange and white fur with the eyes of the cat. Very good, very good. So that would be an example of the gene pool uh, for the cats, and Vanessa was describing, in this case, the color of their fur, so great. When we're talking about um, populations though, remember um, in terms of evolution, we say that it's the environment that decides for these populations which of those traits, in this case, Vanessa is describing the color of the fur, um, and it's the, the environment that acts upon them, okay? So the different ways that the environment acts upon them and can lead to evolution are these three different ways. Okay, I'll say that again for those of you that missed it, okay? So we're using the example of my cat, okay? So we're using the little orange guy here, orange and white. He has yellow eyes. And then we're using our, our other guy, which is Chevy. Uh, he's playing, <laughs> but he's black and white and he has green eyes, okay? So we're talking about, in this case, the trait of color, okay? And the way that natural selection can basically cause evolution, there's three ways that can happen, okay? They're called stabilizing selection, directional selection, and disruptive selection, okay? So I'm gonna show you with examples, three different ways that the environment can say, hey, those traits are good, they're bad, you know, and, and what happens after, okay? So the first one is called stabilizing. Can you read this please, Melissa? What is stabilizing selection? A selection that favors the middle phenotype extreme and selected against. Okay, so stabilizing, um, meaning stable or like steady, right? So when this happens, the environment, like let's say, let's say we have, I wish I had three cats here so I could show you the differences, but imagine I had a third cat, okay? I have my, my, my black, let's just call them black for simplicity. So I have my black cat, I have my orange cat, and then let's say I have a, a bright pink cat, okay? Um, the, the, the stabilizing selection refers to how nature selects 
the average color phenotype. So, so raise your hand if you've ever seen a pink cat, guys. Or give me a thumbs up if you've ever seen, I mean, hopefully not, right? But I imagine you haven't seen any crazy pink cats, right? So the middle phenotype, like Melissa said, refers to the average phenotype or the average color. So have you guys seen black cats in your neighborhoods or in your life, or do you own a black cat? I'm assuming yes, right? I'm assuming you have seen black cats. Black cats are actually pretty common. And in the city, you'll notice that darker colored cats are actually a lot more common. So a stabilizing selection. Um, go ahead, Jaime. Oh. So a stabilizing selection just refers to the fact that nature favors being average. Okay, and even if we're not talking about, about cats. And this example that I'm providing you here um, um, robins typically lay four eggs, like it, like it says here. Um, they can have more and they can have less. So the average though for this example is that they lay four eggs, okay? So if a robin lays like a thousand eggs, that would be one of the extremes on the opposite end of this curve. If they only lay like one egg or no eggs, that would be an opposite extreme on the other side of this curve. But what a stabilizing selection is trying to tell you is that normally nature favors the middle, which is what we call stabilizing. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Can you give me, uh, um, how about Melissa, an example of stabilizing selection? Well, something you're familiar with, because you know me, I like to check in with you guys and make sure you get it. Can you give me an example of a stabilizing selection, Melissa? How about Daisy? Can you give us an example of a stabilizing selection? Um, probably butterfly or moss that have like brown wings. Okay. So they blend into the trees. Okay. So so what would be the what would be the middle or the average then? It would be having brown colored wings. Okay, and then so what would be like the opposite extremes then? If brown is the average, and I'm going to go ahead and, and write here your example um, so everyone gets this, I'm going to write. So, so we're saying that the average, let me go with the color that sticks out. Let me do, we'll do green. So we're saying that this case, forget the robin eggs, Daisy's examples is brown color. Okay, so we're saying that brown color is the average, meaning most moths in Daisy's example are brown. So what would be then the opposite extremes here? And this is a made up example, Daisy. So what would be an opposite extreme here and an opposite extreme there, Daisy, for your example? Um, probably like white or pink. Okay, so we'll go with white color. And we'll go with pink oops. because oops, because some moths can be white, of course, um, and there might even be some pinkish colored ones, but we're saying that on average, they are brown, okay? Does this make sense so far? This is just saying that, that nature, when it selects the average, we call it stabilizing. And it does not choose the extreme ends. Thumbs up if this makes sense. Okay, cool. So that is an example of stabilizing, but that's not the way it always works, okay? Nature doesn't always want to be average. Nature does not always just want brown moths, okay? The other, um, other example is called a directional selection. Can you read us this one, please? How about, how about Jaime? What's, or Felipe, can you read us? What's a directional selection? Directional selection. A selection that favors a phenotype at one end. Yeah, and so um, going back to, to Daisy's example, um, sometimes they can be white, right? Sometimes moths can be white. So when nature switches gear and says, you know what? 
So uh, favors one at one extreme, all right? So let's say that nature says, hey, the white color, those are good, okay? Or the pink colors, those are good. Directional as in like it's switching direction towards one extreme. Now, you guys might be familiar with the Industrial Revolution, right? Have you guys heard of the Industrial Revolution? Yeah. Yes. I'm assuming so, right? So what happened during the Industrial Revolution in Europe was um, a really, really peculiar case of something we call the peppered moths. And what happened is that prior to all these factories being built due to industrialization, most moths were actually very light in color. They were all like a whitish, grayish kind of color. And the reason for that, or actually, does anyone know the backstory behind the peppered moths and what happened to them? Because I don't want to like steal your thunder. Does anyone know what happened to them? Has, has your social studies teacher covered this? To the moths? I mean, some of us covered it in um, a past class. Okay, can you tell us what you know about the peppered moths, Vanessa? And I'll fill in the gaps if you have any. So, yeah, the okay, so the originally before the like factories that, that were installed from the Industrial Revolution were like working and like built, mm -hmm. the moths, the peppered moths, would like blend in with these like nearby like trees that were white. Yeah. So, the favorable trait was white because it was the easiest to like camouflage with so that like prey couldn't find you. And the prey that we used was birds. I'm not sure if that's accurate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. But after the, and like after like the factory started building, like the trees started to, um, became tarred. So like the white moths couldn't blend against the like, the surface of these like now like dark and black trees. So. And, go ahead, sorry. So in turn the like the moths couldn't camouflage so they started like being like, hunted down faster so that the darker moths would have a better chance of surviving. So eventually the darker moths became the more common trait because most of the most of the population that was darker moths had the ability to like survive and therefore like pass on their um, alleles. Fantastic. Fantastic, Vanessa. Never mind. <laughs> I was gonna I thought I was gonna have to to uh, to fill in the gaps, but you had none. So that's exactly correct. Um, so this was in the 1800s, guys, and uh, like Vanessa said, something very unusual happened. Um, nature suddenly was forced to, or actually moths were forced to change uh, in lieu of changing the environment, man-made environment. So if you're not familiar with the Industrial Revolution or if you've never heard that story that Vanessa just told us, um, the the trait of being white was actually favored against in the 1800s with uh, large scale manufacturing and factories and, and pollution and trees, which is what most moths tend to you know to uh, breed on and live on. Um, they actually had to to change color, and they didn't just change you know like Lamarck said. They change because variation comes from genetics, right? So all moths have, just like you, the potential to be different colors because they have genes for different traits. And in a very short time span, I think this was a question Daisy asked uh, the other day, can evolution happen very quickly? Um, yeah, you know, this was a rare case where that actually did happen, but this is, this is microevolution, don't forget. Um, so what happened is when the trees started changing color because pollution industrialization turned the barks of trees dark those moths adapted and the the trait of being light went away and now entered the dark trait so this would be an example of a directional selection like Felipe told us because now one phenotype is being selected for does that make sense and so now everyone kind of followed along so that's what we call a directional selection it's not the average. Now we picked one of the very extremes because in this case, like we just saw, something extreme happened. Does that make sense? Or Vanessa, did you want to add anything or does anyone have any questions about that? So I think it makes sense. Go ahead, uh -huh. uh, Yeah, it makes sense, thank you. 
Okay, okay, good. And thank you for explaining it. Um, okay, so that is called a directional selection. Uh, the last uh, example is called a disruptive selection. And obviously this one doesn't sound good. Can you read us please, uh, Alexa, what is a direction selection? Oh, a di diversifying selection that favors both extreme and phenotypes. Yeah, so, so this one is unusual. This is where basically not the middle is selected for. It's everything else that's selected for. So let me go back to um, Daisy's original example, right? So the original example was that we had, in a normal distribution, we had uh, brown, right? This was normal. And then Daisy had told us that sometimes there's white, right? Sometimes there's white moths. Uh, and like we just saw or heard from Vanessa, in uh, rare cases, the extreme like white can be selected for. And then we have also this um, example that Daisy gave us of a pink. So a disruptive selection, guys, would be where the brown is not selected for. Only the extremes of white and pink would be selected for. Okay, that's unusual. That's not really the case most of the time. Um, but in rare instances, like if for some reason um, all of our trees turn pink, and white, that would be a case where those two traits would be selected for. Does that make sense, guys? Disruptive selection. Yes. Cool. Okay, good. I didn't think this was I didn't think this was too bad. I think you guys were gonna catch on to this pretty easily. So I'm glad. All right. So that is the three different ways that um, nature can change our populations. Um sorry, my cat's moving my light here. He wants to be in this conversation too. Okay, so um all right. Now, like I had said before, and I'll say it again, natural selection is not the only way that evolution occurs. There's many, many other ways. And one of the ways I want to talk about is the way that you probably have seen in nature and has made you scratch your head. Like, why does this bird look like this? Has anyone ever seen this bird, by the way, that I'm showing you on this, on this picture? Yes. What, what, kind of, what kind of bird is that, Melissa? I don't know the name, but doesn't it dance for its partner? Exactly. Uh, um, so maybe you've seen this bird in, in nature documentaries. It's very, very famous. It's considered one of the most beautiful birds on this planet. Yes, that is a bird. Um, yes, um, it, it looks like it has these two little blue eyes and a blue smile. Um, this is called the bird of paradise. And birds of paradise like this, um, look very, very unusual. They stick out. There's no way that this is, um, you know, being blended into the environment. This is not like Vanessa's example where it's a directional selection, right? The environment didn't say, hey, turn into a smiley face and survive so you can blend in. This is completely different. This is completely different. In fact, this is almost insane um, that some animals would look like this. And it's because natural selection is not the only way evolution occurs. There's, there's many other ways, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So can you read us this slide, please, uh, uh, Melissa, so we can talk about this bird? Natural selection isn't the only way evolution can occur. Example, brightly colored birds such as this bird of paradise are not the result of natural selection because they stand out to predators. So, so then why do you think, Melissa, that this bird, I know you, you said um, something brief about it, but can you tell us what you know, Melissa? Like, so then why does this bird look like this? And is that a male or female, Melissa? It's male. It's male. Okay. So do you want to take a guess, Melissa, or, or anyone else? Why did these birds of paradise look like this then? They're brightly colored to attract like females. Okay. And they do the dance. <laughs> they do their little dance to try to impress them. Okay. Good. Good. Anyone else want to add to that? So they do all that so they're able to reproduce with the females, or else the females won't allow them unless they get impressed by the dance. Yeah. Yeah. So so you've probably seen, and if you haven't seen, please watch more BBC Nature specials. I'm obsessed with them. There's actually a whole BBC 
um, series. It's on Netflix. Um, it's called Birds. And it goes into birds from all over the world. And this bird, which is called the Bird of Paradise, is a bird found in Papua New Guinea. Um, it's an exotic bird that, like Melissa and Felipe said, they, they're extravagant. They're, they're brightly colored um, to attract mates. So this is literally uh, for sexual reproduction. There, there's no other reason. This is not stabilizing selection. This is not directional selection. This is not like Vanessa's example where nature says, hey, turn into a bright colored bird to blend in. This is so different. It's almost crazy that a bird would look like this, but it happens. So what I wanna do is show you a quick little video about um, this. And so this has a term. Um, it's not called natural selection though. No. Does anyone know what it's called when, when birds are and it's not just birds, right? But when animals are like strikingly bright and, and stand out um, to attract mates, does anyone know what that's called? Not natural selection, something else. Never heard of this? No. It's called, it's, no, called, no. it's, it's, called, it's okay, it's called sexual selection. And so what I want to do today, I was going to talk about um, the other uh, ways that evolution occurs, but let's start with sexual selection just because it's, it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, and like I said, that's what, that's what this is an example of. So I have a quick little video that I want to show you here, guys. And here's another example you're probably more familiar with. Um, so we don't have birds of paradise here in, in California because, like I said, they're only found in, in New Zealand, uh, in Papua New Guinea. So they're found in the, in the, in the Pacific. They're not found here. Um, but here, you've probably seen this bird. Anyone? You guys know what this is, right? Yes. Okay, so which one do you think is male and which one do you think is female? The one with the long wings is the male. Okay. And again, why is that male that bright and big, did we say? To track mates. To track mates, right? So what I'm going to do is show you a quick little video um, called Survival of the Sexiest, okay? So um, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> it's true, though. It's true. So let me go ahead and everyone turn on your mics. We're going to go ahead and watch this quick little video. Um, go full screen for you. Here we go, guys. Right. Here we go. So this is about that bird that you just saw. And if you haven't seen it, um, there's a really cool documentary on, on um, Netflix. It's, a, it's called BBC, which stands for British Broadcasting uh, Company. Birds. And there's tons of them. This is a Nat Geo one. Okay, here we go. The male snozzle nauseum chick magnetium bird of paradise. Male? You mean that's the boy bird? Look at his tail! And that beak! How does a bird even get a beak like that? Well, that's a good question. And the answer is sexual selection. Uh, no, 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 not like that. It's a process of evolution. You see, the birds of paradise live in, well, paradise. They have plenty to eat and very few predators to eat them. How do they get fancy from that? Well, since they don't have to worry so much about eating or being eaten, life is less about survival of the fittest and more about survival of the sexiest. So a bird that isn't fancy will die? No, but only the fanciest males will attract females. And the more females attracted to a male means more... Uh, more fancy babies. Correct. More males that look like him and more females that choose like her. Oh, I get it. Sexual selection. Because the girl birds select the fanciest boy birds. So their babies will be fancy too. Exactly. Sexual selection means choosing things. Keep your offspring looking great. That's right, folks. Sexual selection is why the birds of paradise look like they do. But have you ever wondered how it works? Well, visit part two later in the exhibit to find out. All right, so go ahead. And, and like I said, there's tons of really cool videos on, on uh, birds of paradise. And actually, this is the same one that I just showed you. Um, 
But again, if you have some time or if you just want to learn more about sexual selection or if you're just really into birds, there's tons of cool videos on the birds of paradise. This is like the keystone like species of, of, of sexual selection. It's one of the most beautiful birds found in nature. And I'm going to show you just a really quick display. All right, so I'll go ahead and pause that. Like I said, there's there's tons of YouTube videos you can watch on, on those birds if you're interested. But any questions so far about uh, sexual selection? So we're good? We get sexual selection? Yes. Okay, all right, so let me go ahead and Go back to my slides. So like I said, that's that's one way that um, evolution can occur. That's not this whole natural selection business, right? And remember, natural selection um, isn't just one thing. Like we just saw, it can occur as a directional selection. It can occur as a, as a stabilizing selection. And it can occur as a disruptive selection. Now we're talking about Oh, OK. So, uh, so penguins are another good example. Uh, penguins are also the result of, uh, well, so penguins and birds that, that also look like penguins, like puffins, if you've never seen uh, puffins, uh, think about, first of all, uh, where do penguins live? Penguins? Yeah, where do penguins live? Antarctica. So if you, if you didn't know, um, penguins... Um, which are found in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's not just Antarctica, it's also Argentina, there's penguins, and, and even in Africa, there's, there's penguins. So um, penguins are two-toned, right? They have a, a black and they have a white. And does anyone know what feeds on penguins? Orcas? Yeah, so the number one uh, uh, predator of, well, I mean, that's not the number one, because also of seals, uh, feed on on penguins, but but penguins are the result of uh, their environment. So the predators that hunt them, um, like all predators, usually just see in two colors. They're they're what we call monochromatic. So they usually just see in shades of of grays or, or blacks and whites. So having this two tone color, just like think about like zebras that are black and white. What feeds on them are big carnivores like big cats. And because predators see in just black and white or two-tone, being those shades helps to blend into the environment, um, similar to penguins. Um, of course, there are penguins that have like really, really extravagant headdresses like emperor penguins, and that's more the result of like sexual selection. But for the most part, penguins, like, like a lot of animals, are shaped by natural selection. Um, so sexual selection. But again, this is not the only other way that evolution occurs. There's actually two more that I wanted to talk about called gene flow and genetic Ooh. trip. So can you read us, please? How about, how about Jaime? Can you read us what is gene flow? And I'm going to give you an example of that. <clears throat> OK, gene flow, when al um, alleys um, are moved from one population to another. Yeah, and the term is kind of self-explanatory. Uh, when alleles move from one place to another. So 
Gene flow just means like when your genes move. An example of that is right here, okay? So let's say, uh, pretend we're in our classroom, okay? Uh, so if we are population one, and Miss Cordero's class, which is right next door to us, right, right next door, um, we call her population two, her class, and the little red circles represent you guys, my period four, and her period four represents population two. A gene flow is simply, like Jaime just said, when your alleles move from location to location, meaning you're moving somewhere else. And because wherever you move, you take your genes with you, right? So let's say that the period four, Mr. Trujillo's class, you guys were your own little population that had never met any other population in the world. But then, um, you know how I have that little lab in the, in the middle? Um, and that's our barrier. Let's say for whatever reason, that doorway is left open. Well now, population one and population two can, can visit each other. That's called the gene flow. Does that make sense? That's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Does this make sense, guys? A gene flow where you migrate and you take your genes with you. Yes. That is pretty, and, and, and a good example, uh, guys, you've probably heard, you know, is when an animal migrates to some, you know, very, very far off place and it takes its genes with it. And you guys have probably heard of, you know, cases where, you know, island species, um, they take their genes with them and they end up becoming something so incredibly rare, uh, very different than the mainland animals, which we're going to talk about next, um, because that's called a genetic drift. Can you read this genetic drift? Uh, how about Felipe? Genetic drift. Genetic drift. When alleles change in frequency due to ch chance events. Okay, let, me, and let me pause you there. So, so um, there's two ways, and I should have maybe put this as a different bullet point. So there's two ways that chance, and chance just means kind of like random, okay? I'll, I'll, put, I'll put random. There's two ways that these random events can happen. Um, and when you think of drift, I want you to think of Tokyo Drift. You know how Tokyo Drift, if you've never seen the movie, a drift just means like a sudden, it's like a sudden sharp change. That's what a drift is. So a genetic drift, like Felipe says, is where uh, the, the frequency of alleles changes, not because of you know, some like stabilizing selection, not because of uh, simple migration, not because you know, sexually it makes you look better, a genetic drift is a random event that occurs, okay? So there's two ways that this happens. The first one is called a founder effect. Can you read us that one, please, Felipe? Sorry, I cut you off. All right, founder effect. Small group splinters off and starts a new colony. A great example of this is when a species that lives on a mainland, so think about the animals on, uh, um, actually, uh, Melissa, think of the animals from Madagascar. The animals from Madagascar, in case you don't know, where, do you know where Madagascar used to be? Does anyone know? Does anyone know where Madagascar, the island, used to be? It's the second largest island. Uh, it's a huge island next to the coast of, if you've never Africa. seen the movie, Africa. Thank you. So the animals of Madagascar guys are um, mostly lemurs in case you didn't know of, of course there's lots of animals there but the the most famous example because i see melissa's little penguin guy are, are lemurs and if you've never seen the movie madagascar um there's obviously tons of different species of lemurs but a lemur do you know what a lemur is guys it's a boomerang do you know what it is like what type of animal it is like what group of animals it's related to. Felines? Yeah, it's a primate. Yeah, it's a primate. It's a very, very, and if, you, if, you, if you've never seen a lemur skeleton uh, or any other primate skeleton, um, lemurs are what we call um, quote unquote primitive primates. So they are um, genetically very, very similar to monkeys. Um, a little further down the line from humans and, you know, a lot further down the line from us, but they are, they are 
very similar to monkeys. And what happened to the lemurs of Madagascar, guys, it's an example of a founder effect. Because what happened is some of the primates on Africa, because of what happened with plate tectonics, like we already talked about, um, the island of Madagascar, pretend my hand or my large arm is the continent of Africa. What happened with Madagascar is one little chunk of Africa floated away. Okay, and this large island that we call Madagascar took with it all of the animals that were on that island, and in isolation, those animals evolved into new species, which we call lemurs. And the lemurs of Madagascar are found nowhere else on this planet, nowhere. Yes, there are monkeys all over the world, and yes, there are animals that kind of look like lemurs, and that's because their environment kind of shapes them that way. But lemurs are only found on Africa. So like ring-tailed lemurs, only found in Africa. Um, um, so that's called the founder effect, where some random event, in this case, islands forming, um, cause what we call a founder effect. The second effect is called the founder effect. Can you read us this one, please? Uh, how about Cynthia? Can you read us what is a bottleneck effect, my bad? Can you read us bottleneck effect? Bottleneck effect. Bottleneck effect. Populations reduce in size by factors such as disaster. Yeah, so, so let's say, uh, for example, we have um, all of our population of, uh, of, let's just continue with the Madagascar example, right? Let's say we're on Madagascar, we have all our lemurs just chilling, but then um, disaster strikes, uh, monsoon, right? Because it's an island, there's a monsoon, and it wipes out half the population of lemurs on there. So now there's only a small group of lemurs. And over time, now that we have decreased significantly our gene pool, because now we don't have all of these different types of lemurs, right? Let's say we have 10 lemurs, okay? And natural disaster strikes like a monsoon, it wipes five off the, the island continent of Madagascar and only five are left. Well, now only those five can interbreed with one another. So now these 10 that would have mated with one another, that's, that's no longer a possibility. We only have those five left. And those five are going to be very different than the 10 that could have interbred. So that's called a bottleneck effect. So let me show you a picture of what these things look like. So here is a founder effect. So again, if this is our population of Africa, and um, let's say they all, you know, float away on the island continent that we call uh, Madagascar. Um, they take with them their genes, right? And they make, over time, their own new population of species. So that would be a founder effect. The second is called the bottleneck effect, like Cynthia just told us, where something like a disaster strikes. So let's say these red and blue uh, represent our alleles for the original population. And because of whatever um, drastic event happens, our population gets, gets cut in half, okay? And these surviving individuals left over now only have these alleles to mate with. So now it's not gonna be equal distribution of reds and blues because you, as you can see, we didn't include that many blues to begin with because of the disaster that took place. So now over time, our last generation, as you can see, their alleles will be mostly the reds. Okay, and I know I'm talking a lot in like uh, uh, metaphors here, but um, the definitions I think are pretty self-explanatory. Let me pause there because I've said way, way, way too much. Um, gene flow. Can you tell me in your own words, Daisy, what is a gene flow? Um, it's pretty much when like those are um, species will bring their traits to another mm -hmm. location. Good, good. And can you give me an example of that? Like, what if, like, maybe if the lemurs were moved to another place away from Madagascar? Okay. Um, genetic drift. Can you read us, Vanessa? Uh, uh, or in your own words, I'm sorry. Vanessa, can you give me an example of a founder effect? Um, what do you think? Uh, an example of a founder effect could be um, I think this is correct, but like, feel free to correct me. Um, when like the Europeans brought like their um, their species of like bees to us, 
and they kind of became like the like one of the like dominant like pollinators so like since they were like more dominant which i mean um they could fight off like the previous pollinators and since they were like are those like livestock hold on one second since there were like crops for them to like pollinate from and they could fight off the like already pre-existing species they could like reproduce there so like they created their own home in like a new location because they were about there by like um assuming mistake okay yeah i mean that would be an example because they're starting their new uh their a new population right good and a bottleneck effect can you give me an example how about cynthia your own example of bottleneck effect Are you there, Cynthia? Uh, how about uh, how about Jaime? Your own example of a bottleneck effect? Um, would it be like a like um, wildfires in Amer um, in Australia? Mm -hmm. Um, because um um because it reduced like a, um it killed off a lot of animals that lived off in those um forests. Yeah, yeah, very very good example, and I think something that you know we kind of forgot about because it kind of you know it happened so late in the year, and then all this virus stuff happened, and everyone kind of just forgot about that. But absolutely, and you know they're still accepting donations to the Australian wildfires. But yeah, very good example. I'm gonna pause there. I just saw the time. We've been talking for a very very long time, but. Gene flow, genetic drift, sexual selection, um, uh, disruptive selection, directional, stabilizing. So six good concepts. Um, that's really the majority of, of the quiz. So if you guys feel up to it, you can go ahead and just message me. I'll turn on the quiz for you. If you'd rather, you know, reread my notes and study over the weekend. I know some of you already took the quiz, which is great. But if you want to, um, take it you can just message me and I'll turn on the quiz for you otherwise we'll go ahead and pause there I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen with you just so you guys can see me um, and now my cats have all gone to sleep so I think they're telling me it's, it's time to take a break too so um, any questions about those six things we talked about so we talked about sexual selection gene flow genetic drift disruptive selection directional selection and stabilizing selection. So what questions do you have about those guys? We, we heard a lot of good examples by students, so I think you guys get it. Um, but I, I, I don't wanna leave you guys, you know, hanging and kind of like scratching your head. So any other questions about those six? Um, um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Daisy right. or Vanessa. Yeah, either, go ahead. You may go first. Okay. So, like, I was going to ask about sexual um, selection. Uh -huh. Like, if they're so like, extravagant and they stand out a lot, even if they are able to mate, what if, like, they get killed off before they can even do that because they stand out so much? Yeah, but that good, good point, Daisy. But, like, they said in the video, um, it's because where they live there's not really predators so um new guinea is another really rare example guys because just like madagascar guess what there's not on those islands guess what they don't have on those islands predators there's no lions on madagascar guys there's no tigers there's no bears there, there's there's not predators there so that's the really cool thing about islands and I know I'm, I sound like I'm working for Netflix, but there's, there's a really cool documentary. I'm such a nerd. Uh, there's a really cool Netflix documentaries um, like Planet Earth. If you've never seen it, please watch the Planet Earth series called, um, called Islands. Um, the animals that live on islands are so extremely rare because of the, well, a couple of reasons. One, 
because their founder effect, like straight up, like they, they, they got to this place. Um, they, they are like their old ancestors, but they've evolved in isolation on an Island with no predators. It's crazy. So um, that's the, that's the reason Daisy is they, they have no, not just no competition, but really no predators. So it's very unique. So you're not going to find like birds of paradise, in Los Angeles, for example, right? Because there's way too many competitors, including humans. And uh, New Guinea and Madagascar, there's very, very, very few people there. But good question. Any other questions? I um, wanted to ask if uh, it's called, it was possible, like there could be combinations of these different like collections of evolution? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because um, like you just saw, uh, gene flow and genetic drift are kind of similar anyway. Um, if you think about it, right, um, even the way that sexual selection works, like it's kind of like shifting towards one extreme of looking anyway, which kind of sounds like a directional selection. So yeah, none of these are like one thing by themselves. We just kind of give them these terms just to differentiate like what's what like how they're how they're different but yeah of course the, these things are not like straight up like in caps underlined one thing at a time like um, evolution and genetics they're so complicated all we're really looking at is like what's the end result but yes they do work um together and actually you'll see as we get to the end of this uh, module because we're almost done we'll be done next week you'll see that yes that does happen so good questions all right y'all it is 1230. Um, great questions, great examples, guys. Thank you, um, as always, for your awesome examples and good questions and for participating. Um, so as usual, I'll record this, post it up for those of you who didn't get a chance to jump in today. And if your friends didn't watch my YouTube video, tell them Monday is a holiday. <laughs> it's Memorial Day, so class will resume on Wednesday. Cool? Got it. What are you guys doing for, uh, does anyone here have military family? Thumbs up if you have military in your family, because I do, two generations. Military, Jaime, yeah, good. Oh, just Jaime and me? Okay, okay, but still, you know, um, the United States, it's a national holiday. We have to honor the people that fought for our country. So uh, please uh, do something to celebrate. If you have a cousin that's in the military, your parents, like give them a, give them a Zoom call. <laughs> zoom and thank them for their service okay so signing out guys have a beautiful weekend and uh see you guys on wednesday all right all right guys peace stay healthy bye guys